In 1991, Sega was really feeling the heat from its competitors' arcade divisions. Namco and Atari had been developing Polygon titles for a number of years by this point, and Sega felt it was falling behind. Their 1980s lineup had been dominated by Superscalar releases, and were quite well received, but it was clear that times were a-changing. Determined to retake the technological lead, Sega began developing a brand new polygon board known internally as the CG Board. This was the very first time Sega had developed hardware to specifically accelerate three-dimensional polygons for the purpose of playing games. But there had been an honest discussion internally whether this tech was even a viable investment with long-term potential. While polygons in games had been around for a number of years, it was still a relatively unproven way of playing games across different genres. This led Sega AM2 to develop a tech demo showcasing exactly what the new CG board was capable of. So utterly impressed was Sega's executives by the results, they fully funded the making of that tech demo into what would eventually become known as Virtua Racing. This would kick off a newfound sense of purpose within Sega and began their journey with cutting edge arcade polygon technology for the next decade. Virtua Racing became the poster child of what could be accomplished with powerful 3D game engines and led to a number of home conversions over the years. In this episode, we are gonna take a look at how these home versions turned out and which ones provide the very best experience today. Hope you guys enjoy Sega's Virtua Racing Battle of the Ports. Before we get into the home versions, let's first talk a bit about the arcade. Developed by Sega AM2 and released in 1992, it was the very first game that would run on the CG board, or what would eventually become known as the Model 1. This technology used flat-shaded polygons like a few other arcade boards at the time, but what separated Sega's new project was its ability to move around thousands of polygons effortlessly at 30 frames per second. In order to achieve that level of performance in 1992, the CG board was a complicated piece of kit. It had half a dozen CPUs, 10 GPUs, and an unheard of amount of memory. But the end result was undeniable. Never before had a 3D polygon game looked and ran so impressively. It was ahead of its time in other areas as well. It supported widescreen, had no less than five cabinet types, with multiple deluxe units, and supported as many as eight players in link-up battles via its virtual formula configuration. Despite its cutting-edge tech, the game itself was quite simple in terms of content. There were only three tracks, each designated as easy, normal, and hard. There was only one car to use, and the race was set to a grueling time limit that didn't allow you to finish most of your races until you got a whole lot better. Yep. This one was a quarter muncher, or in this case, a dollar muncher. The sound was also a bit weird, because it didn't have a full soundtrack like other Sega racers. Instead, you had various short checkpoint celebrations that would quickly give way to just engine noises and tire screeching. But there is no question this was an impressive showpiece for Sega's new Polygon ambitions. It was fast, smooth, and ran at a progressive, medium resolution that really made the visuals pop. When I first encountered a cabinet in the wild, it was a standalone deluxe unit with a 50-inch screen. I remember standing there in absolute awe, captured by its soft glow and entranced by the futuristic technology that would change the gaming world forever. The very first home port of Virtua Racing was a shock to say the least. I don't think anyone was expecting it to land on the Sega Genesis of all things, but leave it to Sega to pull a rabbit out of a hat and give us the unexpected. In 1994, they developed the SVP, 
short for Sega Virtua Processor, an add-on chip that allowed the Genesis to render far more polygons than it ever could have alone. The results were rather impressive, all things considered. 3D console games at that point were still rather rough in terms of performance, but Sega was able to capture some of that arcade magic regardless. The tracks were there, the camera angles were there, it had two-player split-screen action, and believe it or not, the gameplay was close enough that it still was quite an enjoyable racer. It was amazing that 1988 hardware was doing this, even with an add-on coprocessor. Not everything was perfect, however. The arcade had been a fairly smooth 30 frames per second, but here it's about half that, making things run rough in comparison. Sega also didn't add much in the way of additional content. This was a $100 title at its release, so with just three tracks, longevity was definitely an issue. The biggest thing for me, however, was the lack of color. Because of the way the Genesis displays its visuals, the SVP could not help it up its on-screen color, resulting in polygons that are rather drab and often heavily dithered. Side by side, there is no question the Genesis version is a lesser experience from a sound and visual standpoint. The home port gave you the feeling of familiarity, but it had a long way to go before it would be mistaken for its Model 1 Big Brother. As impressive as it was given the situation, we would not get a perfect home rendition of Virtua Racing with this one. Nineteen ninety four was a season of many ideas within Sega, and the SVP powered Virtua Racing had been small potatoes compared to what was coming. Not only did Sega have its new thirty two bit Saturn landing in Japan in November that year, but it also had its entry level cousin, the thirty two X, hitting around the same time. The strategy had been simple. Saturn would take the high-end market of older gamers, while the 32X would leverage the installed base of the Genesis with a much more affordable option. Among the first releases for the 32X had been Virtua Racing Deluxe, an expanded port of the arcade version with more cars, more tracks, new music, and a vastly superior presentation when compared to the Genesis release from earlier that year. And oh my, was it quite an impressive showing. Smoother with much better color use, this was a closer take on the arcade original bar none. But it wasn't just your eyes that were treated better here, as the extra content really elevated the status of this release. There are now three cars, the formula, the stock, and the prototype, each with its own characteristics and feel. In addition to the new cars, you also get the three original arcade tracks plus two new ones. Also making a showing is split screen mode, which allowed two players to compete against one another. Add in some cool replays, multiple camera views, and a time attack option, and this really was a great port that showed off Sega's new add-on in a positive light. It wasn't perfect, mind you, but you just had to be impressed given the gulf of power between the 32X and Sega's Model 1. When 1995 rolled around, Sega decided to license out the Virtual Racing IP to Time Warner Interactive, who would bring a new version of it home to the Sega Saturn. This was the first time Virtua Racing was not handled by Sega internally, and Time Warner intended to leave their mark. And that they did, because this feels pretty much like an entirely different experience. You do get the three original arcade tracks, but now there are seven new ones added to the mix. Also new are the addition of four cars on top of the original Formula One from the arcade. These tracks and cars range in difficulty from the slow and easy go-kart races to the expert level combination of the prototype on the Pacific track. There is also a new Grand Prix mode that allows you to pick a team and race a full season where you must gain points in order to unlock cars and stay in contention for the title. 
Before you jump into that challenge, however, the arcade and practice mode is there to help you come to terms with the gameplay. And if you have a friend with you, split screen action is also an option for you. While this one gets a bad rap from time to time, Time Warner really did try and take it up a few levels in regards to content, especially when compared to Sega's typical home conversions. The sound and visuals also see a massive uptick over the 32X version, and now have much better polygon models, though it still doesn't stay quite as fast as the arcade. This one definitely has a feel all its own, however. Playing it back to back with the arcade, it's clear the driving model was redone and feels like a different game altogether. If you were looking for something more than the arcade, this one delivered, but Purist will likely scoff at the gameplay changes. The IP would go into a near decade slumber before showing up again in 2004, thanks to the Sega Ages 2500 line for the PlayStation 2. Like Time Warner Interactive's effort, this was not developed by Sega and was intended to be a huge upgrade of the original arcade experience. Thanks to the power of the PlayStation 2, you saw what was the best graphics a home port had ever delivered for Virtua Racing. High polygon counts, smooth performance, better resolution, and even the draw distance got touched up a tad. It's an eye catcher to be sure. But in addition to all that visual pizzazz, you also got new cars and tracks, which was surprising for a budget title that was half the price of a normal game. This was a standalone release in Japan, but when it came west, it was included in the Sega Classics collection, with a number of other Sega Ages releases. Honestly, I adored this take and still consider it a great addition to the Virtua Racing lineup. For the very first time, the Model 1 was not only challenged, but bettered, and that was saying something when it came to Sega Arcade ports. It had taken over a decade, but this was what I had been wanting to see all along. It made you hope for a new home version of Star Wars Arcade, even though you knew that was highly unlikely. And please don't let the negativity of some of those other Sega Ages 2500 games drag down your interest in this. It was a fine looking and great playing adaptation that did the IP justice and finally delivered the arcade home better than ever. Once again, Virtua Racing would go into hibernation, this time until 2019 when it was resurrected by M2 for the new Sega Ages line for Nintendo Switch. This one was a bit of an undertaking because it was one of those games where the source code had been lost by Sega. This forced M2 to use incomplete code from Virtua Formula to aid in their rebuilding of the engine, assets, and gameplay. To their credit, the M product was a real upgrade, featuring resolution as high as 1080p, a constant 60 frames per second, and no polygon draw in at all. As nice as the PlayStation 2 edition had been, this easily was the best this franchise had ever looked and played. It does have some color issues, but outside of that, it was a beaut. M2 had also added both local and online multiplayer, loads of little options that helped the difficulty, and a Grand Prix mode, which was an endurance race where pit stops were a mandatory strategy to do well. As for the question of home ports and which one is better, this is what you want if you're seeking the best experience. As nice as this version was, I'm gonna confess something here. I really did feel as though this was Sega's attempt at finally taking the Sega Ages line beyond the usual suspects and giving us something from an era of arcade gaming we all really wanted to see. M2 did a great job here and proved that even having to rebuild the games from this era weren't beyond their capabilities. Alas, the Sega Ages line on the Switch 
would come to an end with no further developments of similar pedigree. No Virtua Fighter, no Star Wars Arcade, nothing from the Model 2 or Model 3. Even Saturn games got the shaft. This version just served as a sad reminder that no matter how close we get to something truly special, no matter how many steps forward Sega takes, disappointment always looms on the periphery waiting to strike and rob us of what we truly want. The legacy of Virtual Racing was an undeniable success story. When you're talking about the arcade and how it influenced an entire industry, but the home ports would leave behind a rather mixed reception to say the least. The Genesis version was a technical marvel, but the thing retailed for $100. The 32X edition was a great improvement over that Genesis release, but it was attached to a doomed add-on that few people played. The Saturn Virtual Racing tried to strike out and give us a load of new content, but by the time it was out, you could play Daytona USA at home and Sega Rally was right around the corner. The poor Sega Ages 2500 edition got lumped into a compilation in the West that most people avoided because of the horrific reviews. The other bad games on that disc really hammered any interest the majority of Sega fans had. And then Sega, in their infinite wisdom, decided to make the 2019 Sega Ages remake a freaking Switch exclusive, cutting off millions of potential customers on the PlayStation and Xbox. The fact is, this title was never in any situation where it could have actually earned the respect it was due. This is a sad and unfortunate reality, because to see and play this game in 1992 was nothing short of incredible. It was so far ahead of anything else, it took nearly two console cycles before a hardware platform did it any real justice. Of course, by then it had aged out so far content-wise, it just didn't seem special anymore to a lot of people. This seems to be a recurring theme with Sega's contributions to gaming's past. Wrong place, wrong time, and nearly completely forgotten by the time anything is done with it. What's so sad is, is that Sega has a massive catalog of titles that either fall into this category, or worse, have never been given any second chance at all to show just how incredible the company was in its prime. There are Sega games that blessed arcades across the globe in the 80s and 90s that have not been seen since, leaving history little choice but to praise other software in their absence. I've argued for years that Sega has been its own worst enemy in regards to its legacy. What should be a celebrated, readily available library of unforgettable creations are now just a footnote among modern audiences, with little to no consequence on how gaming history is retold. I honestly weep for the future, because most will never know what these games meant to millions of the Sega faithful and beyond. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.